Good evening and welcome to the Pony Club Victoria Equine Dental Health webinar with guest presenter Mark Burnell. Mark has over 35 years of experience as an equine dental technician and is accredited through the Equine Dental Association of Australia. Mark grew up riding at Kangaroo, Kangaroo Ground Pony Club and these days he has the role of Pony Club Dad with daughter Charlie in the saddle, busy attending rallies and competitions on her off the track course. Mark sees his role as an equine dental technician is important in terms of animal welfare and ensuring the horse can do their best. We are grateful to have Mark with us this evening and sharing his knowledge with us all. So welcome and over to you, Mark. Kathy, uh, thank you very much. So um, we're with COVID, I uh, hope everyone's well, but um, this is the new format for getting around and communicating. So this is only my second go with this, but we'll do my best. So there's two main reasons for doing horses teeth. The first one is to improve the horse's ability to eat the food as efficiently as possible. And the second reason is to make the horse comfortable while it's wearing the bit. Um, horse dentistry isn't something new. I took over a family business that went father to son for a hundred years before I came along. Um, and there were horse dentists before there were cars. Uh, the guy who taught me can remember as a, a young man going around with his father. His father did far laps teeth uh, that they would go in a, a horse and cart to do the work. But back then, horses were played a huge part in e everyday life. Around where we live um, in Carnegie, Bentley was a huge market garden area. The Marriott's a very famous family in the Clydesdale Society. The suburb of Bentley was pretty much their market garden and they provide a lot of the uh, fruit and vegetables for Victoria. My grandfather had delivery horses. He had 40 odd Clydesdale crosses delivering milk around the suburbs, Pasco Vale, Coburg and Essendon. And they worked six days a week, uh, pretty much 52 weeks of the year. And those horses were amazing. So that's where my interest in horses began. So the, the most important thing to remember as a horse owner is to understand what's normal and what's not normal. Uh, your horse can tell you in a variety of ways. Um, the, I think there's a pi picture, Kathy, of me checking a horse's lips somewhere. Might be the next one along. Okay. So uh, there's me doing a horse with a gag. On a gag, the apparatus we use to actually feel the teeth safely. You can do some horse's teeth without a gag, in particular if they have damage to their front teeth, or um, they're perhaps a bit uh, frightened of the pressure of a gag. The gag is a restraint, but generally we like to use the gag where you can feel all the teeth and get the rasp around to rasp what you need to rasp. In doing horse's teeth, what we're looking to rasp off are all the parts of the horse's teeth that the horse can't naturally wear off. So this is a skull, of an, an upper jaw of a gelding. We know he's a gelding because he has these teeth here that are called bridle teeth. They are not canine teeth. Um, some female horses do have these, mares and fillies, but generally it's a male only tooth. So male horses have generally have four more teeth than fillies and mares. I think that's a question in one of the certificates. Uh, with their upper molars, it is the outside edge nearest the cheek that gets sharp. And on their lower molars in their bottom jaw, so here we have the bottom jaw, it's the inside edge nearest the tongue that gets sharp. So it's the trailing edge. It's my job is to rasp off what the horse can't naturally wear off. Horses in their grinding motion, so their upper jaw, if you could imagine, stays still, and the lower jaw rotates around in a circular fashion. And it's normally always one-way traffic. So they'll either have the power stroke or the connection stroke from the near side to the off or from the off side to the near. But pretty much if you can imagine the upper jaw is stationary and the lower jaw doesn't chew like us, which is up and down, but rather a lateral movement. So the food gets trapped and long fibres get cut into shorter fibres and whole grains such as oats, um, and even uh, steamed and rolled barley get mushed up. They get mixed with saliva. Saliva is a really important, important ingredient 
in digestion because it's full of enzymes and the enzymes break the start the digestion process and in particular sugars starches get converted into sugars with amylase which is a um, a product that is found in saliva so you've got the horse's teeth evolved about 60 million years ago and i've got some caps here caps are baby teeth so these are some teeth i've just taken off in the last couple of days um, and you'll notice on these teeth there's some black holes and there's some uh, white i don't know if we can sort of see that some white lines okay those white lines are the hardest parts of the horse's teeth they're called they're enamel and i'll get a pair of these okay so there's two two upper caps from a horse that's just turned three and you can see they're a mirror image of each other and there's all little swirls and what have you on them so the black bits are, are like uh, indentations and there's a white ridge and all those little cups you notice they're a semicircular shape and the bottom tooth which is the opposite of that has uh, some cups that are going in the opposite direction and these cups virtually come across trap the food and cut it as it gets the jaws past each other as horses get older their teeth wear and all those uh, cups that you can see become smoothed out and the surface of this tooth is what we called a cupped crown so all you're left is one sharp enamel ridge around the perimeter and none of the little sharp uh, enamel lines in the middle so as the horse's teeth get older not only do the roots of the teeth become shorter so this is a came out of a horse that was in its late 20s and if you look at the skull of this horse here, he was a 14-year-old. Uh, you can see the top of the roots of the molars are there down to here. So in a horse's lifetime, all the tooth wears away at this surface here. And as it wears away here, more tooth gets pushed out of the body to replace that that's worn away. So it's a self-replacing system. So horses' teeth, depending on what they eat, tend to get sharper over time. Grass is the easiest, green grass is the easiest thing they'll eat. And over 12 months, their teeth will sharpen up a bit. The minute you introduce hay or hard feed, such as whole grains, and even some of the commercial pellets that are on the market now, the amount of work the teeth have to do, it actually wears the teeth away faster. So I have racing clients that have their horses checked every 10 to 12 weeks. Some racing stables, every horse is checked every eight weeks because they're expecting them to eat as much food as they can so that they've got as much energy to do the work that they need to do and be fit to race in the races. And you're constantly checking horses. I think uh, this week there's a tooth here somewhere out of a horse called Russian Camelot. If anyone does watch the races, he'll be in the cox plate. He is the most beautiful horse you're ever going to see. So he's a... Northern Hemisphere Colt, uh, he's uh, not yet four, and he's something very special. So um, these horses are still losing their teeth and still expected to race at the highest level. So you, you're always checking up on what's going on. We've got a young skull here. So this is a horse that was um, three rising four, and you can see where, um, okay. We can see where there are some caps. Caps uh, sit on top of the adult tooth. So I don't know whether we can see that. Not be too close. Yep. Did you want me to change to the no. other screen, Mark? I think you can see that little line there. So what we have on top there is a cap and the adult tooth underneath. And if we look at the jaw of this horse, there's lumps on it. So they're called teething lumps. So that's often a way that you can perhaps have a guess at the horse's age because while you've got the adult teeth growing, they're pushing into the bone. Eventually they push the cap off the top and they'll disfigure the bone for a couple of months or possibly up to a year of the horse's life. So it's often a, a time to be a bit compassionate about your horse with nose bands, in particular how tight they are because you'll be putting pressure on this erupting tooth and uh, softish bone of the horse's jaw. 
So getting on to um, the bidding of horses, just, uh, is that okay, Cathy, or is that? Yep, that's great. Is that okay? Yep. Well, maybe I need to try this differently. Hang on, bear with me. The thing to remember with bidding, bidding um, is one of those, it can have a 1% impact on how a horse goes. Along with uh, good training, um, having a nose band that's correctly fitted, not too tight. Horses should always be able to open their jaw and lick their lips when they're wearing a nose band because that helps them adjust their pharynx so that they're breathing as, as efficiently as possible. When a horse's nose is artificially clamped as tight as it possibly can be, you're creating a lot of tension, and in particular in the masseter muscles around the jawbone, which in some horses also put stress on the neck and make the horse a lot tight in the forehand. So the thing to remember, this is a, a gelding. Um, uh, he was about 14 years of age when he was euthanized. He was a 16 odd hands. In this space here is where the bit goes. This is on a live horse, is completely filled with the horse's tongue. So the tongue helps push the food from the front teeth, which are called the incisors, past his canine teeth, because he's a gelding, and up into the molars where the, the teeth can work laterally against each other and mush the food up as finely as possible before swallowing. Chewing should only take a few minutes. Swallowing follows chewing. It's then about 40 hours that the horse has that food in its digestive tract before it also does a dropping. Often looking at horse's manure is a simple parametric on how well your horse is digesting its food or how efficiently it's chewing its food. If your horse has got a lot of undigested grains in their droppings or a lot of long random fibres, chances are there's probably a bit of wear and tear on their teeth if they're an older horse or perhaps they're eating too quickly and forcing the food down. So there's a lot of things noticing about your horse that are important that'll help. And when I was a, a kid in Pony Club, everyone used to use one of these big fat egg butt snapples. snapples. So I don't know if that will sit there. Here we go. So remembering that the horse wasn't born to have a, thanks Kathy, to have a bit in its mouth. The bit sits in the palate, ideally with the tongue underneath all the time. You don't want the horse drawing the tongue back and getting their tongue over the bit because the bit will then rest on the bars of the jaw, which are very, very sensitive. And often that's then the time most horses will get their head up and try to run away, which isn't good. So the bit sits in the roof of the mouth. But for these fatter bits, for a horse to be comfortable, often they'd have to open their mouth up and a, an equivalent amount. On went the drop nose band, it would clamp the horse's mouth shut. So what do you want the horse to do? Either open its mouth or close its mouth. And some horses will take this as an offence and start doing what they want to do instead of what you want to do. So it wasn't until I was a horse dentist and I started to question what went into horses' mouths that I looked at some of the oldest bits and all old bits were this shape. So this is over 100 years old and it would have been worn by a draft horse all day. But for some reason, they'd worked out after thousands of years of domesticating horses that bits that were this shape were most comfortable for most horses. Now, a lot of our bits are made in Korea or Pakistan, America, all sorts of places. That shape's gone and um, a lot of that knowledge is starting to come back into bit making now. The... Newer bits that are this shape, you can buy them, they're worth trying, but having your horse comfortable is a good way, starting point for perhaps convincing it to do what you want to do. And if you look at the history of bits, there's a lot of bits that were designed to possibly torture horses more into submission rather than doing what you want. You'll hear people talk about a nutcracker action. So this is a bit that's a very poor shape. It's a V-shape. I think these are illegal in Pony Club too, Cathy, because you've got two different metals. 
The reason bits have two different metals in them is that it supposedly creates a, a small electrical uh, tingling on the horse's tongue of about 0.1 of a volt. Horse saliva is an electrolyte solution. And when you get two different metals in an electrolyte solution, you'll get electric um, electrons moving. So for a dry mouthed, unresponsive horse, sometimes these bits did prove to be useful. But however, this shape wasn't too conducive into getting the horse into what you do, what, doing what you would like it to do. Every time you ask the horse to either turn left, turn right, stop or rein back, the bit would go in this motion ever so slightly, poking the horse in the palate or pinching it on the tongue. So they found bits that didn't have a nutcracker action were better. Some of the bits to think about, um, always check your bits. Um, second hand bits, I'm not sure how clear that all is. So this bit um, is an FM bit. And as you can see, it's become quite worn. So it's one of those things that uh, the milder metal bits over a period of time will become asymmetrical. It is important that it is symmetrical in the horse's mouth. Otherwise you can get a lot of funny head tilting. This bit on the surface of it looks like a good bit. It's got a good shape. In Queensland, they like what they call the two finger rule that you can fit two fingers through a bit. But this bit's actually asymmetrical. So regardless of how good a rider you are, one, depending on which way you put the bit in this horse's bridle, most horses would end up tilting their head, either one way or the other. So it can um, backfire on you when you think you're spending a lot of money for a good bit and you're hoping for an improve, improved behaviour response. All of the multi-jointed bits follow the simple philosophy that you can fit two fingers through and it's that better shape that suits most horses. But there's a lot of variation amongst these bits. And it gets a little bit confusing as to what's going to work and what's not going to work. But of course, people love making things when things don't go right. So you can end up spending a lot of money on bits and depending on what you want to do, it might control the horse or it might really annoy the horse. But all these bits are based on basically the same idea. It's a three piece to it. Just a note for all Victorians, all twisted bits, whether they're twisted wire or twisted shanked, plus a, um, as this bit is, uh, regarded by the Prevention of Cruelty Act in Victoria to be cruel and are not to be used. It unfortunately doesn't stop people selling them or buying them. If you are at a competition and happen to notice one of those bits, that's probably something that shouldn't be used there. Bits that have a bigger distance between where the cheek piece goes up to this small ring, versus the rain, create a, a slight leverage. These bits are generally designed to lift a horse's pole. They can also improve the um, braking abilities of the bit. So a horse that's a bit heavy in the mouth and is inclined to be um, pole low, too often this should lift their pole and make them a little bit lighter in the mouth. So it's not the ideal bit for a horse that is naturally high headed, uh, as you may end up getting them um, too high in the pole and possibly um, causing you some harm. All the straight bits, so we've got Kimber Wicks or Spanish Snapples. This is called a port. And the idea of a port is you, you're creating some comfort for the horse in its tongue and um, something to to accommodate the shape of the palate. Every horse's palate is a different shape. So different bits with different ports on them will have a different effect on every horse. The rule of thumb is the bigger a horse's head, and if it's a nice Roman nosed old fashioned Clydesdale cross, it would probably 
be quite happy in a bit with a high port such as this. A very dished faced Anglo Arab or fine thoroughbred would probably find this bit somewhat offensive. You notice this bit has several different slots to put the reins. So as the rein gets further away from the cheek piece, piece this bit becomes uh, severer in its action on the horse's jaw. And also you've got the added tension of having a chain under the horse's chin. For the finer headed horses, what tends to happen with these high ported bits is that the port tends to sit back and sit in between the two rows of molars. So it's really important that the bit does fit. Um, having horses measured and fitted for bits is a really good idea, but then trying to find a bit that actually will fit your horse off the rack can be a bit tricky. Um, speaking from experience, <laughs> that um, sometimes a 110 millimetre mouth isn't the greatest thing. It's very pretty to look at. So here we've got a Dutch gag. So you've got a big distance between where the cheek piece is and the most severest action of the bit is when the rein's on the lower ring. So bits are there for, to assist in training the horse and for keeping it safe for the rider. And hopefully uh, the rider is in a position to um, be kind with those aids and give the horse the best direction as possible. The fitting of bits is becoming a bit of a, uh, a business for some people, which is really good. What seems to be critical is the distance, especially when you're using the French snaffle type bits or three piece bits, is the distance between these two or lower molars in the bottom jaw. So here we have a 16 odd hand gelding thoroughbred. And here we have, she's very old, but I actually did this horse when she raced, sadly. Then we have a 16 two hand thoroughbred mare. So the taller horse actually has a narrower jaw. And as she got older, she actually lost a couple of molars and went off her hay for um, a week or two when we discovered she had loose teeth. But when they were removed, she went back on her hay and actually went back in foal. So finding a bit which will, uh, there, that's a bit lucky where the central piece is narrower than the inside edge of those lower molars can be very tricky. The prettier your horse's head, the more difficult it's going to be to find a bit that can actually do that. And often what's on the rack will not work. So every bit can be a, a subtly different and we think they all look the same, but they'll have a massive impact on how the horse behaves and responds to pressure from the bit. Kathy, can we put up the slide of aging the horses? Sure. So one of the key things of aging horses, apart from it being one of the greatest guesses you'll ever make, <laughs> is that um, branding's fantastic. And the thing with branding is it's within a 10 year cycle. So there's definitely something different about a horse that's five versus 15 versus 25. Now in the literature, you'll hear about a thing called a Galvane's groove. Galvane was actually an Australian. And when you've got to imagine when there were, there were no cars, and horses were used for everything. It was really important to know how old the horse was that you were buying. And people used to go around telling prospective buyers the age of the horse, so it was a big deal. And Galvain discovered that horses got a groove in their corner upper incisor. So that's the, this tooth here. Now, the rule of thumb is it's at the top of the incisor near the gum level at 10. It got halfway at 15 and got to the bottom at 20. 
And Galvain, Galvain also claimed he was never wrong guessing the age of a horse. So um, he was a genius. But um, it is a general rule. This particular horse has got um, significant enamel ridges on all of his incisors. So a horse like this will generally look older because his Galvain's groove will look longer than on a horse that doesn't have such folds. We start looking at the shape of the teeth. And the thing that um, with horses, when they're around 10 or 11, this central incisor here, it becomes a sort of more triangular shape. The one next to it, which is called the lateral incisor, will be oval, and the corner one will also be oval. By the time the horse is 15, the central one is still triangular. Uh, going to triangular shape. The one next to it's a bit circular, as this horse is, and the corner one's oval. And as they get older, this lateral one will become triangular as well, and then the corner one the same. So we look at this mare that was 20 odd when she was humanely euthanized, and you can see that all three of those central, lateral, and upper incisors are of uh, it, that's becoming an oblongy shape, but this is now becoming triangular and this one's circular. So that's that subtle change because the young horse, and here we have a horse that is four rising five. We know he's a gelding or he was because he's getting canine teeth. When canine teeth erupt, there's no accurate way of guessing a horse's age. Some horses, some males get them when they're two, some get them when they're seven, some get them when they're nine. So there's no rule of thumb. But this horse here has four adult upper teeth and two baby teeth caps or deciduous teeth in the corner. And if you look at these teeth, they're all, tri um, they're all oval and in the middle is a black hole. That's called an infundibulum, a cup or a cusp. You've got to love horse people. They never have one name for everything when you can invent three and confuse everyone. So uh, as time goes on, this surface will wear away as it's grinding on any food that it may eat. On all food it will eat, it will wear its teeth to a point where these central uh, teeth will lose this cup or cusp first because they're the oldest then the teeth next to them will then lose the cup or the cusp the following year and on and on it goes and the teeth slowly change shape. So it's on the lower jaw of younger horses. So here we have the five-year-old gelding, rising five, and you can see he's still got an infundibulum or a cup on all four of these teeth. Now, by the, but it's starting to wear away. So by the time he is five, these teeth will go, the cup will be pretty much gone from these central teeth. Um, by the time he's six, it'll be completely gone. By the time he's seven, the cup will have gone from the lateral teeth, the two either side of it. And by the time he's eight, when he's got permanent teeth here, the cup on those teeth will also have gone. So it's like dominoes, first they lose, the cups on the central teeth, then the teeth either side of them. So it's pretty tough aging horses. Um, the older they get, the more you guess. Um, and the thing to remember is to just try and have a look at, at possibly uh, having the horse branded or microchipped, and then you probably won't make too many mistakes. So Kathy, have we got any questions at all? I will have a look in the chat, Mark. Um, not at this stage. If anybody wants to ask Mark a question, please uh, pop it in the chat um, and he'll be happy to, to answer. Or if there's something in particular that you want him to cover, um, please let us know. Um, Mark, I think your variety of bits is quite impressive. Uh, I don't know how you collect all of those, but um, yeah, it's good to see. We do have a question come through. So um, 
we have a question on thoughts on anatomical bridles and Michelin's. Yep, that's a great question. Um, it depends on the horse. Uh, they're beautifully made bridles. Uh, the assumption that the horse's nerves are in the same place exactly on every horse um, can't, uh, it, it doesn't quite work that way. Unfortunately, it's, it's a bit like trying ice cream in the ice cream shop. Um, that you have to give it a go and see if it helps your horse with its particular problem. Um, but they are excellent, especially as they tend to hold the bit up into the palate. So for horses that are inclined to get their tongue back and get worried if the bit is um, perhaps sitting in the wrong position and then therefore getting their tongue over the bit, they're often very useful for that. Um, some of my clients claim uh, miraculous changes in horses' head carriage and behaviour by keeping the same bit and changing the bridle. So if it works, it's good. But it, as for Cathy touched on, there are only some of the bits I've collected. <laughs> uh, you could spend a lot of money on the steel work and bridles and all the gear. And at the end of the day, you have to train the horse. Um, and the, the bits are an aid. So it, it's all about uh, that connection that the horse understands it, what you want it to do. I hope that helps. Yep, I think that does. Uh, next question is, one of my boys had recently had a wolf tooth discovered at the start of the year. Why do they need to be taken out? That's a very good question. So uh, here's some uh, wolf teeth from today. So I don't know if you can see them. Okay. So wolf teeth are a prehistoric remnant. My apologies to anyone that is religious, but horses did evolve. And um, the subspecies before what we've got today had four extra eating teeth. Um, when I was in America, I got to go to the uh, museum in Nebraska and there's fantastic fossil records there um, from all sorts of animals, but in particular, the horses. Uh, the, some subspecies of horse uh, had four extra eating teeth in a position that you would now call a molar. Um, others only had two, but also amongst that fossil record. Um, so wolf teeth sit generally just at the apex of the first cheek tooth. Some horses have one, some have none, some have two, some have three, some have four, which is even rarer. Um, but the evolution of the horse, we're not actually certain what subspecies of the early horse, the modern horse evolved from. Uh, a lot of their molars in the fossil record, generally um, you've got four crowns and four root processes on every upper molar. The lower molars, you've only got two crowns and two root processes. And some of the early horses had really, really intricate um, enamel patterns across their teeth. What we know about grass, if those horses were given a feed of pasture as we know it, they either would not be able to eat it or they'd need an enormous amount of muscle driving their head to work the two rows of teeth that were very, very sharp with lots of fine enamel ridges on it to eat grass. But because you're dealing with a fossil, you don't know how much muscle was actually on the horse's head. And we're not even certain what they ate. So there's a lot of assumptions that are made. Uh, that's the job of the paleontologist. And um, because only the bones live in fossil record, we've got no idea exactly what plants they lived on. Wolf teeth still have nerves and blood vessels in them. And the nerve and the blood vessel is as big as it is on any other molar. So I'm not sure if we can quite see down the guts of that tooth is actually a, a small hole that would have had a nerve and a blood vessel in. Uh, so removing the wolf teeth is something that um, dental technicians routinely do, especially when you're taking the first upper cheek tooth away. The wolf tooth can often sit, 
snugly against the lingual side, the tongue side of that cap, or at the front. So often when you take the cap out of the horse's mouth, this tooth's left wiggling around and a lot of head shaking and head tossing begins with loose wolf teeth. As the bit sits in the palate, the wolf tooth is in the palate, the bit hits that, horse flicks its head. So there's a, a Cox Plate winner I did a couple of years ago, Seamus Award, and um, I took, uh, was sweating on taking his wolf teeth out. They weren't ready because the cap wasn't ready in the guineas, which he ran a fourth in. Took his caps and wolf teeth out um, a week and a half before the Cox Plate, which he won. But he jumped out, he kept his head in a kind position and never flicked his head and won the race and is now a very valuable stallion. So little subtle changes that you wouldn't think a tooth like that would make the difference, but it can. Um, if they're in the lower jaw, they can cause a lot of problems. I hope that helps. More questions. Thank you. Our next question is uh, your opinion on power tools versus hand tools. Yep. I'm a traditional dentist, so I only use hand tools. Um, I was at the first two international conventions in America where they were trialling power tools back in 1985, 86. Uh, the first power tools they developed were for shaping canines. And I stayed around after the convention in Nebraska and they electronically reduced the canines and were trying to work out how they could use power tools to do incisors and molars and everything else. Every one of those horses developed uh, what I later discovered was pulpitis and were quite, um, they got a bone infection, so all their lower jaws swelled up. A couple of them were quite colicky. And uh, eventually those teeth, because of the heat insult of the power tools, they weren't water cooled then, they cooked the teeth and they eventually had to be removed if the horses lived. In my life of 36 years of being a horse dentist, I've only ever seen three loose canine teeth that needed coming out. And that's because they had a condition called equine ondontoclastic uh, you know, a resorbative tooth root and hypercementosis, EORTH, very trendy at the moment. And the, the tooth root of the canine is, is curved and to remove these is quite difficult. But when the tooth root um, resorbs and you get enough gum disease, you can extract them. Um, the risk with power tools, which this jaw has been done, one side with a power tool is quite smooth. So all the little enamel ridges which are in a normal tooth are there for a reason. And making teeth smooth on the grinding surface where the teeth occlude is actually of no benefit to the horse unless you're going to feed it mush. Um, so it's, it's a delicate line that you um, tread with power tools. They can do a lovely job. They should be water cooled, but there are a lot of risks in using power tools. There's enormous risks with power tools in incisor reduction. A lot of people get a bit worried if their horse's incisors aren't perfect. Uh, Brad Pitt, we've got to thank for that. But um, here you can see one side of this, unfortunately he's lost some teeth, this horse. I'm hoping to teach him to whistle shortly. Uh, but these teeth are touching and these aren't. When you create gaps that aren't equal across the entire row of teeth, because all 24 molars and 12 incisors have to work together, you create a lot of tension around this joint here. This is a temporomandibular joint. And this is one of the most important joints in the horse's head. It's a synovial joint. So it's like a fetlock or a knee, but this never stops. It's driven by masseter muscles Masseter muscles are four times more anaerobically efficient than the heart muscle because it, the horse, has to eat. It has to be able to keep eating. If you shorten up the incisors, you disrupt the balance between that and all the molars and you put undue pressure on a synovial joint. And that's where you get a lot of um, soreness around the horse's uh, TMJ and pole and it can be quite nasty. 
So it's something that um, you need to be very experienced and practised in if um, you're going to do a lot of stuff with it. But there are some good practitioners out there that do use power tools. With my business, um, all the horses I work on are largely unsedated, often with power tools because it sounds like a set of clippers. The horses have to be sedated. Uh, as I'm doing performance horses like a, that are running in important races where they are taking blood and urine samples, uh, we have to use horsemanship and common sense. And it's um, slowly, slowly. So does that help? Yeah, fantastic answer. Thank you. Our next question is, what is the most challenging phenotype slash physiology that you have had as a client? That's a good one. Um, I could say barrel races, but then that'd be naughty. Um, no, um, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> some lovely barrel races out there. Um, but the uh, every horse is different. The different breeds uh, can be difficult in the wrong hands. Some horses are incredibly sensitive uh, and in the wrong hands they become difficult and dangerous. They are a, a creature of flight and sometimes, uh, in particular with the thoroughbreds, they've sought horses with... Uh, an ability to access nervous energy because often they're quick, but there comes a point of time where there's too many eggs in the cake. So those horses are too quick for their own good and nearly impossible to train. Um, and sadly, they often get on sold in particular the mares, which are then used for breeding crossbreds, warm bloods, show ponies, whatever. And surprise, surprise, they breed difficult warm blood crosses and riding ponies. So the temperament of the horse is a coefficient of something that's genetic, but also the environment in which they're brought up. But most horses, if you're kind to them and prove to them that you are not there to hurt them, uh, are generally forgiving even unbroken horses doing their teeth. So today I was doing unbroken stock horses out in an open paddock and they're amazing, but they're you know, they're well-bred horses, they've been well handled. And uh, in my business, I do a lot of yearlings as part of their yearling preparation going to the sales. And they're, you know, it's a great start in their life. We have to, our role is to teach them to relax while they're getting their teeth done. You don't want to be fighting them. Um, but there aren't any really cranky breeds that spring to mind. I find uh, Arabs, a lot of people like to pick on them, but I find Arabs incredibly intelligent and they don't enjoy the company of highly strung people. So um, it's a fair indication of who's, who's around if you get a highly strung Arab, but um, most horses are pretty good. Thank you. Our next question is, how do the Myler bit levels work? Um, Myler's bits, uh, I have actually don't have any here because we've been trialling them on, on my daughter's off the track thoroughbred, who's uh, uh, can pull a funny face. I mean the horse, not my daughter. Um, and uh, they, they are excellent. They're beautifully made bits like the bomber bits. Um, the higher level and severe bits can tend to get a horse in a fixed position. Um, if you're riding a dressage horse or a uh, roping horse that they, they require their pole in a different position relative to the horses with it and often the bits can artificially they, they're great at their job which is putting the horse into a uh, what looks like a highly trained position so it can be a bit of a false economy um, some of the more severe uh, miler and bomber bits I've seen do some terrible damage to horses tongues uh, to their gums, to the bars of their jaw. Once a bit, if a horse rolls its tongue out the way and the bit can bear down onto the bars of the jaw, there's the jawbone there. This is really sensitive and there's just a, a couple of millimetres of gum and you're touching the bone. Those horses, um, they get behind the bit and then they then they want to bolt. Um, but it, it's... Um, not a good thing to do. So you need to check your horse's lips. I think somewhere 
There's a picture, Kathy, of me peeling back a horse's lips looking like a goat. Yep. Um, could be the next one. It might be the um, this one from there the front cover. Okay, it's really important that you get your horses really comfortable with touching them around their muzzle and being very gentle and stroking them and playing with their gums and lips and checking that everything's okay with their mouth for several reasons. It's good to always peel the horse's lips back and look at the colour of your horse's gums. They shouldn't be purple. Uh, the horse is really sick. They shouldn't be bright red. It should be a lightish pink with a darker red halo around the teeth. The, if you put pressure on the, the gums, so it's like, um, I don't know if you can see this. So put pressure on the horse's gum and when you lift your thumb off, it should be white. And then you count to three and the, I don't know if you can see that. Be better there. Um, count to three, all the capillaries should fill that area that you're pressing on once again to bring it back to the nice pink color. Uh, it's a good indication of, of uh, the saliva should be like water. It shouldn't be sticky. Horses' breath should be fresh. They're her herbivores, um, if their breath is bad, um, if the saliva is really thick and gelatinous, and that, that might be doing something with its eating, it might be eating its hard feed or leaving its hard feed and preferring to eat grass and not eating its hay or eating its hay and quitting, which is where they uh, chew the hay and spit out a ball. They're all unnatural things uh, for a horse to be doing. A horse should just simply eat its food and not stop. So uh, having your horse comfortable with what's going around its mouth and also checking the crease of its lips to see that your bit isn't cutting at all is, is also an important thing to remember. Thank you. Our next question is, hi Mark, my mare has a big head. Do you recommend any special care other than the usual dental checks? No, and I bet she hasn't got the biggest head I've ever seen, but um, <laughs> uh, we call that an unfortunate head in the trade. Um, <laughs> the shape of the head and size of the head, often a bigger head, uh, gives you greater opportunity to try different bits, more so than the dished face. So if we look at the variation between like this gelding here and the space between his upper and lower jaw versus the little riding pony. And even this guy here is the different the difference in that space to where the bit would sit is unique to every horse. The prettier faced horses have a lot of trouble getting bits to fit correctly and comfortably. So they used to make specialist equipment for doing the big headed horses, uh, special gags and um, rasps because the, some of those uh, draft breeds like Belgians, uh, Suffolk punches, they are massive, absolutely enormous horses. I saw a lot of them in America and they, they're all over a ton and they are huge, incredible horses. Thank you. The next question is, I know an 18 year old Welsh pony that virtually has no top teeth. Not sure yeah. if he has worn them off from chewing rocks or something. Will these teeth keep growing? Just haven't been able to get to a dentist get a dentist to look at him yet, he's eating okay. The, uh, the front teeth are the most obvious, but their role is to crop grass. A horse that's lived on a Jenny Craig paddock or an environment where the topography of your soil uh, is quite abrasive, its teeth will wear faster than a horse uh, that lives on soil, that uh, lives on grass that isn't Jenny Craig paddock, like lush pasture with better soil type. So uh, in Namibia, they make uh, talcum powder. The rock in Namibia is called talcum rock and it's really soft. And it's not unusual there, I'm told, to see donkeys and mules live to be 40 years of age with very, very good sets of teeth because the dust that gets onto the pasture, which is the thing that actually wears their teeth away, 
is is of no impact. Uh, in Victoria, if if we were to breed triplets and raise one of those triplets in the Yarra Valley, one on the Mornington Peninsula and one at Arthur's Creek and looked at those horses when they were 15, the horse at Arthur's Creek would look 20, the horse in the Yarra Valley would probably look 15 and the horse on the Mornington Peninsula would look slightly younger. And it's all to do with how much green grass is available. That is assuming they weren't uh, founder prone and locked on short grazing to prevent founder. But in Arthur's Creek, they have what's called buckshot soil. So it's all little tiny rocks uh, that are iron, uh, an iron oxide. And that is so abrasive on the horse's teeth. Uh, you're a brave person if around Arthur's Creek you start guessing ages because if they've lived there all their life, they will look far and lived on grass, they will look far older than a normal horse. Horses that are stable and get hard fed all their life, their incisors or their front teeth never do the work of a horse out on pasture. So once again, they can look far younger than a normal horse. Very good. Um, our next question is, when horses grind with their molars, does the direction they grind, right or left, indicate whether they'll go better on the left or the right rein? We don't know. And there are some horses that will grind left to right or whether power stroke or right to left. You'll do their teeth and they'll swap that motion. So it's like someone in, in year 12 who's been right-handed up until that point of time, suddenly becoming left-handed. Like it is a, a strange conscious decision to alter the chewing pattern. If you see a horse altering the power stroke from left to right, left to right, there is something either wrong with its teeth or wrong with its epiglottis and swallowing mechanism in its pharynx. Um, but yeah, we don't know enough. There's a, a lot of theories about, you know, horses being left or right dominant. A lot of our handling that we do is on the near side. So horses inadvertently will be, sort of be slightly flexed to the left. I know handling horses that I can do more to a poorly handled or unhandled horse on the off side than when I can on the near side. So that's, that's always interesting. There's two halves to a horse's brain and they have to learn both things equally on both sides of the body. Good horse braking is mounting and dismounting on the near side and the off side. It's interesting why people get on the near side and why uh, historically, especially we follow the English method as have the Americans um, of horsemanship where everything is on the near side. But when horses were cavalry animals, most people were right-handed. And if a soldier had his sword, it would be carried on his left hip. So if you were going to hop on a horse and your sword was on your right hip, you'd want to hop on from the offside if you're left-handed. Because in battle, their right hand would come across, pull the sword out from their left hip, and then go and uh, hopefully win the war. So interesting. It is interesting. Our next question is, we have a 32-year-old pony who is missing molars. What suggestions do you have for feeding? Um, I've got some spare ones, if we can put them in. And um, the day I work out how we can put them in, this is a molar out of a you know, really old horse. I'd have a helicopter. Think of what his food would look like if he had a normal set of teeth and could chew it himself. An important factor in chewing food is saliva. So over wetting feed isn't doing the horse an enormous amount of good favours. Having them slow down because hard feeding is replacing good grazing and most horses on good pasture have got their head down for 12 to 15 hours a day. We've outsmarted ourselves that we can give them a high calorie diet in, and they can scoff it down in minutes. So you need short fibres, so chaff, along with something else that gives him some energy. So chaff is the backbone of good feeding for horses with poor teeth or missing teeth. I have a lot of clients with old horses with subfunctional and missing teeth. 
Ideally, a horse needs 70% of its diet should be fibre, which is chaff. Um, if he has a good set of incisors and you can graze him on short, rich grazing, you'll probably find he'd do quite well during the autumn and the spring. But it's in the winter months and the summer that the grass becomes dry. Definitely feeding him hay is risky. If they're missing molars, the chance of colic or choke are high. Um, so you, if you fed him, a think of vitamised feed, uh, add to that the risk of founder, does he have metabolic syndrome, Cushing's, there's so many things with being an old horse, but cheating um, the, the teeth by providing food that doesn't require chewing is the key. And there's lots of things that are highly digestible in forms of energy like speedy beet, that are, are good for horses because they're a different fibre source that they don't have to crush it. Um, copra meal, um, but even steamed and rolled barley, crushed oats, uh, those sort of feeds. Some of the pellets, some of the pellets are harder than grains. So you've got to be picky about what pellet do you choose and can they chew it up and mix some saliva with it before they swallow it with some chaff. Great answer. Our next question is, are there any specific, uh, specific qualifications we should be looking for when choosing an equine dentist or vet dentist? Um, the, the vet dentist, they own the term dentistry now. Um, when I started as a horse dentist, you could advertise in the yellow pages as a horse dentist. There were only three of us or four of us, but um, now it, it means something else apparently, but we're dental technicians. So there's a, an Australian qualification and it's been around for 20 odd years. So there's many good graduates of that. There are some shorter courses, but the key thing is ask where have you got your qualification and have you got insurance? And they're black and white, yes, no answers. For my bigger clients, they actually ask, uh, have you got insurance? How much is it? And then prove it. So I take a certificate of currency proving that I have my 20 million, 20 million cover everywhere I go. Um, some of the horses I do are worth far more than that, but 20 million is the limit and that's it. But um, there are a variety of qualifications and um, best thing is to ask, is it an Australian recognised qualification? Fantastic. Um, our next, we have, we have a thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Absolutely fantastic oh. webinar. Immensely educational as well as very eloquent and diplomatic. That's nice. And then um, another uh, question. My horse has recently started sucking on his tongue. Could this be a dental related issue? Yeah, good question. Uh, they actually um, designed bits for horses that roll their tongue and suck their tongue back. And uh, these type of bits, which I think are probably illegal in Pony Club, where you've got uh, little players that roll around. So the thing is to uh, uh, distract the horse and entertain it. So... Um, all those pathologies like sucking their tongue back, it could be a sharp edge somewhere. It is a, uh, a habit that you really have got to try and remedy. Um, sometimes adjusting your nose band uh, will have a greater impact on the head carriage and behaviour of your horse than it will going on the great bit search. But finding bits that are starting with the simplest um, is the best and often the cheapest. So if your horse doesn't mind snaffle bits and will stop when you ask, this range of bits that are that shape and you can get two fingers in, um, measure your horse's mouth for ring, loose ring snaffles. You want a little bit of steel just sitting outside the horse's mouth, not too much, just so that the uh, lips of the horse aren't rubbing on the rings because if it's snug, these rings will move around a little bit and you'll cherry up the cheek of the horse and you'll get the horse will start to pull. But sucking the tongue back, that's um, 
unless something's changed um, with your training. Sometimes horses, when you go to a higher level of education, they become stressed and they'll start grinding, chewing, um, sucking their tongue back. Uh, stomach ulcers is also something you could investigate, but just remember most horses have stomach ulcers, unfortunately, and will die with them, not from them. And that managing those stomach ulcers, there's a, some very successful strategies. And, and it's all around buffering the stomach, uh, giving the horse something fibrous to chew on while you're saddling it up, like some hay or some loosened chaff. So you're creating lots of saliva and getting a bit of a raft of something in the horse's stomach. But um, once again, it, uh, it becomes difficult. You can get chiropractors, saddle fitters, all of which have a benefit, but I, I depends on the horse. So I'm sorry. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I think that is all our questions now, Mark. Good. <laughs> yes, you've done well. So um, if there aren't any more, um, we'll just say thank you very much, Mark. That, that was very informative and uh, I'm pretty sure lots learnt on, on a lot of aspects in, in dental health. Lots of thank yous from our audience. So um, from Pony Club Victoria and myself, thank you very much for, for offering your time and, and um, yeah, you're very generous with, with Pony Club in general. So thank you. No, thank you. And, and just remember everyone, be safe. So if it, it comes to a tug of war, you've got to win it. <laughs> be, first of all, be safe, whatever you do, and enjoy your horses. And hopefully we'll all get through this COVID thing and get back to enjoying our horses as we should and the companionship that horse ownership brings. So um, I'm still friends with people I met and became friends with in Pony Club from when I was 10. So it's an amazing institution and I say more strength to you. Well done. And thank you, Cathy. You're doing a wonderful job. Well done. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. And um, don't forget, we have our um, we have another webinar coming up on Wednesday night um, for our advanced and grade one riders with um, Mary uh, Longden. Actually, Thursday night. Better give you the right day. And then next week on Tuesday night, we have um, worming webinar with with Jackie Pinozo. So um, check those out on, on Facebook and in your emails. Thank could you, Mark. I, could yep. I add one more thing, Cathy? For just sure. Reminded me. Um, the Australian Horse Industry Council, which, which I am on, we've got a webinar the Wednesday after the Melbourne Cup, uh, a technology Zoom. It would be really important for, and anyone can watch and join. You don't have to be a member of the Australian Horse Industry Council. But there's one of our presenters that's got some really interesting technology which should be of enormous interest to all horse owners. So um, check our website, AHIC Council, um, and we'll have it up on Facebook. But everyone's welcome. But it's some pretty amazing technology in the pipeline. So good luck with your horses. Thank you, Mark. I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I will get the information from Mark and then I'll email everybody so they can have um, direct access to that information. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, Kathy. Have a good okay. night. Yeah, you too. See you. Bye, ya. everyone. Bye. Bye.